So Lauren, how was it to be in the record store buying your own record? Um, it was very cool, but then I'm very British. So I was like, oh, what if this is embarrassing and people think I'm an idiot? But uh, yeah, normally when we put out records, we're on tour. So we don't really have the opportunity to do those things. And um, I wasn't going to do anything. And then my partner was like, we need to do some something for this day. So we went to a record store and we got it. And he made me take a picture outside as well. So it was very good. I'm far away from my mother, but he did very good mothering skills at me. He was like, come on. Take a picture, take a picture. So I was like, okay. <laughs> I can imagine that you buy this album because it's so good. The album oh, is finally out you. and I love it. Yay, thanks, man. I know that we talked before we could really say anything about anything. So now hopefully those cryptic clues make more sense. <laughs> exactly. One, uh, I think a half year we talk, uh, ago we talked about movies and who, which, which actor would star you and your bandmates. And it's all about movies, this album. Screen violence. Yes, yeah. And um, we were watching a lot of films when we were making the record just because we wanted to really channel certain themes and certain sounds. And the songs are still personal songs, but especially with the lyrics, I really like the idea that you could tell pers personal stories through that kind of cinematic lens. And for, for, I think, all the things you did around this album was a movie poster made. Yes, yes. We were really keen on trying to build build a world around the album just because everyone's still in a really strange place in their lives. We can't go see concerts the way we normally would. We can't tour for people the way we normally would. So we figured maybe instead of just using the internet and marketing stuff as ways to try to sell our record, we were like, maybe we can make that creative and interesting and expand on the story of the record. So we did a lot of like film inspired posters for each single and we made a kind of movie trailer deep fake for advertising the album and stuff like that so fun fun things instead of just regular evil advertising <laughs> can we ever we can talk about it can we ever expect a whole church's movie now because you are into it oh man i mean if people have technically already done all that work for us and we just found footage that was out of copyright and then we deep faked our heads onto those people. So technically we could maybe do movie. that. There is one technically. <laughs> it's it's kind of a horror thing this album and that's maybe why John Carpenter is included in this album. That's so good to hear his, hear his remix. Oh man, right? Like we are all such huge fans of him as a songwriter, as a composer, as a filmmaker. And I was literally in the house one day last summer when we were making this album and it was during the height of lockdown and you couldn't see anybody, you couldn't go into anybody else's house at all. And I was thinking it was fun to have a record to work on because it gave me something to do. And I was in my house in the middle of the day watching horror films. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if instead of, well, or as well as the regular club remixes and the kind of dance stuff, we could get somebody to reinterpret it a composer from that kind of space so I texted our manager being like you know someone like John Carpenter and he was like yes start from the top work work down and then he actually responded to us and uh, him and his son and the team that work on his soundtracks now uh, remixed Good Girls and honestly when we got it back I was a little worried it was better than our version because <laughs> he out guitar solo does. We don't have very many guitar solos in songs. And then he added the most ripping 80s guitar solo at the end to replace our one. And we were like, damn, it's better. I think it's better. <laughs> I was, I was the, the first time you saw that he would like to work with you, the first email. I mean, it's with this record has really been cursed and blessed in so many ways. Like the fact that John Carpenter wanted to work on it and Robert Smith is on the record and Clive Barker who is an amazing artist and wrote Candyman and Hellraiser did a design for us as part of our zine and I just feel like a lot of our gothic overlords have blessed this album and we're, we're very honoured and touched by that because we take a lot of influ influence from what they have done and it, rather than them trying to sue us or something it's nice that they can see something in our work that resonates with them. You just mentioned Robert Smith. Let's play the song on the radio and then after that talk about more about the album. Yes, please. I heard somewhere that if you like to work with Robert Smith, he is kind of a night owl. He sends emails in the middle of the night. How, does it, how did it work with you guys? 
Well, at first we were a bit worried about the time zone situation because Ian from the band was still in Glasgow and Martin from Churches and I were in Los Angeles and we were like, oh, if Robert's in the UK, how is this going to work? But he, when we were talking to him about it initially, he was like, that's fine. I keep LA hours. And we were like, huh? And I'm like, oh yeah, we would be like, it would be like 10 o'clock at night here and he'd be like sending us an email saying, I'm just going to bed, here's a demo. And I'm like, wow, he really does. Like he really does stay up all night. It's exactly how I dreamed it would be. <laughs> how was it to work with him? Because I saw this is a dream collaboration for churches. Dead or alive, it must be Robert Smith. Oh man, we are all such huge, huge fans of him generally, which made me worry. I was like, what if he senses that we're like creepy fans? Like we have to like click it down. Don't be weird at him. And But yeah, he was so incredibly generous to us with his time and with his creativity. And, you know, we've met a lot of people over the course of the last 10 years and not a lot of people who have been in music that long are still so passionate about it and so un, like uncynical in uh, the most important sense. And yeah, I think a lot of people get into the mindset of music as a job, music as a profession. And I think he's like, all this stuff, promo is a job, but making music is is an art, it's a passion, it's a craft. and. Yeah, we definitely took a lot away from working with him, I think. Very honored. Can you still, still remember when you heard for the first time the music of The Cure in your life? Yes, I was playing. I'm sure I'd heard, I definitely heard it around in films and TV and all those places. But the first time I was conscious of, wow, that's an amazing song, was when I was 15 I think I was playing in like an underage band night at a pub and the band before us played a cover of Fire in Cairo and it was obviously loads better than all their own songs that they'd written as 15 year olds and I was like wow that one's really good I'm going to say to them afterwards and I was like I like that one about Cairo you guys and they were like it's a song about this band called The Cure you should look up and I was like hmm so the next time I went into the I grew up in the countryside so the next time I went into the city I was like I'm gonna go and look look for this band and then when I, I think I started I got Boys Don't Cry and The Greatest Hits at the same time with the, the one with the stars on the cover and then when I was going through I was like oh yeah I know that one I know that one and I was like what this one band did all these songs and I still feel like that to this day I'm like how can one band have done so many things that I love and especially with the kind of music that we try to make they really are the gold standard of being able to have songs that go on the radio and put, people put them on their mix CDs, but they make these really creative, often very melancholic, thought like deep, intense records. And I think, yeah, they're one of a kind in that way. And it's so cool that you now make a, made a song with him together. It's so great on this album, Scream Violence. I mean, yeah, I think that's the bit that's only just settling in now is that, oh, wow, we're... <laughs> I was like, ah, we're part of like the canon of songs that Robert Smith has made now, which feels very weird. But uh, yes, he's, I can confirm, he's a, he is a legend. He was very nice and very kind and obviously really sick at guitar as well. That helps. <laughs> Lauren, thanks for joining me again. And I hope to see you next year, finally back in the Netherlands with the band. Can't wait oh, for man. that. I hope so. We're so excited to tour and to come back. And we've always had such great fun when we play over there. So please, please let us come back, universe. Please let things get better, I hope, for everyone and for this. <laughs>